wonderful to see so many students and faculty and guests here today. My name is Nina Bush. I'm the Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs and the Director for the Center for Presidential Studies in the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here today for the 2022 Lives in Public Policy and Public Service Address titled, How Can Political Advocacy Change Policy? Now, I'm gonna say a little bit about our distinguished speaker in just a moment, but let me just give you, I'm gonna to try to be very quick here, um, but I wanna just give a little history about the Lives in Public Policy and Public Service Address. This is the sixth one in this annual series. The series was created shortly after we created the Calico School at Hofstra University through the generosity of Hofstra alum, Peter Calico, who also has founded the Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency. When we created the school, the eight Calico School departments, anthropology, economics, global studies and geography, history, philosophy, political science, religion, and sociology create, designed an interdisciplinary major, PPPS, I know there are many students in that major in this audience today, um, that was designed to link academic study of policymaking with pro policy practice. The faculty in the Calico School decided to create this lecture series uh, to encourage and motivate Hofstra students to pursue their own passion for public service. The goal here was to uh, encourage students who are keen to participate in the public sphere, whether through elected office, political appointment, or outside organizations that influence policymaking, to be motivated by practitioners in the field, and particularly, when possible, Hofstra alums. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. Um, for now, I just want to give a few quick thanks. We have five classes in attendance today. Dr. Labresco's Introduction to Civic Engagement, Dr. Fritz's Introduction to Public Policy and Public Service, Dr. Feldman's American Political Thought class, Dr. Parati's Public Opinion and Political Communications class, uh, and Dr. Longmire's Globalization and Human Trafficking class. It is wonderful to have everyone here today. In addition, uh, we have several faculty in attendance, including political science uh, professor Dr. Firestone, who helped to, uh, who was instrumental in creating the Calico School and this, the public policy and public service major, as well as this lecture series. And our external advisory council, uh, composed of many um, alums and close allies of Hofstra who have been instrumental in developing the uh, our program. Uh, Mr. Chuck Catullo, it's glad to have you here today. And of course, our speaker, Itana Jacoby, is a um, member of the External Advisory Council. I'll come to that in just a moment. Let me just say that I'd also like to thank, in addition to our classes and all of you, um, the PPPS Program Council, especially the Department of Global Studies and Geography, which nominated our speaker today. Um, the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for supporting this event. Hofstra University Honors College, which is hosting a small session with our speaker afterward. And if any students are interested in that, it will be at four o'clock. Just come and talk with me afterward and I'm glad to provide specifics. You're welcome to join. Um, Hofstra Office of University Relations, which has organized this whole event uh, and publicized it. Events Management, which is keeping us on track so that we have a permanent record of this important lecture. And of course, the Hofstra University Cultural Center um, for their skillful execution of yet another event. And you can see from the no, numerous flyers on the table at the back that this is where, Athleen, we're not even halfway through the semester yet, right? <laughs> and um, it's just so rewarding to see so many people here. So thank you uh, to all of the people uh, Every, all of the departments, programs, and individuals who've helped make today's event possible. Let me turn now to an introduction of our speaker, Ms. Atana Jacoby, class of 2012, major in political science and global studies. Um, I discovered the purpose of LinkedIn because I was looking that up uh, this morning, Atana, and the long list of everything you did at Hofstra, as well as since graduating from Hofstra was there. I don't, I'm not going to take all of your time, so I'm just going to do a few of the highlights. Itana was a uh, grad, uh, double major, as I said, uh, Center for Civic Engagement Fellow, a peer teacher, 
the Student Affairs Chair for the Hofstra University Senate, uh, Coalitions Manager for the Progressive Student Union, st uh, member of Students for a Greener Hofstra, uh, producer and I believe participant in the showing of the vagina monologues, we were just talking about that this morning, a member of Phi Beta Kappa, and a high honors graduate. In uh, Atana, in a, as a senior, received the Undergraduate Library Research Award for her senior thesis in Global Studies with Dr. Saf, the chair of the department, titled I Globalization, Kodak, Apple, and the Evolution of U.S. Employment, 1960 to 2012. Since graduation, Itana has held numerous positions in education, in advocacy and in organization. After finishing her degree at Hofstra, she was a continued for a year at Hofstra as a Center for Civic Engagement Leadership Scholar and Democracy Fellow. She then went on to teach and serve as a school union representative in Boston. From there, she went to Dayton, which I learned is known as the Gem City. Um, from dating back to the 18th century because it was seen as the gem of the United States at the time, or at least that's what a newspaper report said. Um, uh, Atana went to uh, Dayton as a program associate with the Kettering Foundation. She then joined the um, Hunger in, Halt Hunger Initiative, where she was responsible for reducing, her goal was to reduce food insecurity and increase food access. In that position, Itana was instrumental in creating the Gem City Market, a grocery store in a neighborhood that had previously been described, I think the term is a food desert, uh, to make quality produce and food, a full-scale market, available to the community. Since she was also a board member of the Dayton Co-op, she was a founding member of the PPPS External Advisory Council and continues to serve in that position today. Uh, recently, she, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, I guess now, she moved over to become Deputy Political and Legislative Director for the Communications Workers of America. Now, there are so many personal stories I could share about Atana, and the faculty, several of us had a chance to speak with her yesterday, and there were even more. But I'm just going to bring up uh, two points, I think, that illustrate well her dedication to public service and the public good. An evaluation from one of her mentors in the uh, Center for Civic Engagement, Professor Michael DiNicenzo, um, is a beautiful evaluation, and Atana was kind enough to share it with me. Um, and I just, uh, without reading all of it, I'll just say that she's credited, um, Professor DiNicenzo said that high kudos to Jacoby for her Socratic skill in posing questions and building on comments of others so that students, more than she, engaged in considering options and trade-offs. And I think that describes so well Itana's commitment to deliberative dialogue and uh, deep canvassing, I think is the term. The other one, Itana, I read a beautiful interview with you, um, as you uh, shortly after, I think after you moved to Dayton, it was in 2018, and the reporter asked you what your hidden talent is. And you said, and this is one of the most humblest things, I, I know it's so, I could hear you saying this, if I have a hidden talent, it is hidden even to me. Well, I think you will all see and all of us know that Itana has many talents that we can see, and I know there are many more. And we are so honored and delighted to have her come back and speak at Hofstra today. Please join me in giving me a warm welcome to Itana Jacoby. Well, now that I'm sufficiently embarrassed, um, thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, a special kudos to all the folks that um, Professor Bose just listed, um, especially given that I was very difficult in getting my paperwork and sending my flight information to Athlean and all the things, and Mina's been wonderful um, shepherding me around campus, and it's just really good to be with y'all. So um, I have some remarks planned and would love for as much of this as possible to be interactive because I remember sitting in the same seats y'all did on classes that sometimes I wanted to see the speaker and sometimes I did it. Um, and that's where we were supposed to be. So I hope that this is um, fun and engaging for y'all and things that you're wrestling with as, um, as students that you feel comfortable sharing. So um, about five years ago, almost to the week, 
I was sitting in the Northwest Recreational um, Center in Dayton, Ohio, in this room, and I was listening to a presentation about um, a proposition that some community members had come together and wanted to build a cooperative grocery store, one that would be owned by the workers and the community. And I got this feeling in my belly that I needed to be a part of this. Like, I didn't know what, I don't know nothing about building a grocery store. Um, I hadn't lived in Dayton for very long, but I felt that like this is something that I wanted to do and this is something that I wanted to be a part of. And uh, that night and that decision and that feeling in my belly ended up changing my life. Um, I've now lived in Ohio for over six years. I originally moved to Dayton. Um, no, no, there we go. I moved to Dayton uh, with no intention of staying very long. I, I moved from New York City to Dayton, Ohio, which is a great place. Um, some of us in the audience are, are from Dayton, uh, but it was not a place that I saw myself necessarily, and it's not something I knew anything about. And the more I stayed there and the more I built in that community, um, the, the more my life changed. So Dayton, um, as you can see, Professor Labresco, I have a map of Dayton so people know where it is. Um, <laughs> So Dayton um, is in Southwest Ohio, and it was once the gem city because um, in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, it had the most, uh, what was it? Uh, what is the word? Patents per capita. It was like known as the innovation, like the, the birthplace of innovation. The um, airplane was invented in Dayton. The pop top can was invented in Dayton. Uh, an ice cube tray was invented in Dayton. Cheez Its were from Dayton. The cash register was from Dayton. Um, the electric car starter was from Dayton. All these things were from Dayton. It was a very industrialized place, and a lot of investment was there. And then, um, like many other communities around the country, specifically in the Midwest, Dayton became deindustrialized after NAFTA, after the passing of the North American Free Trade Agreement, and you saw massive amounts of good paying, often union jobs, manufacturing jobs leave. And Dayton lost over 40,000 jobs, good paying jobs that devastated the economy. Um, but the, the impact of the devastation was not equally felt throughout the community. So in 2015, the public, Department of Public Health created what um, we refer to as opportunity maps, where they are looking at um, people's ability to, to access opportunity in the community. This is an overall opportunity map um, that they're listing. They're tracking health outcomes, um, education outcomes, uh, economic outcomes, a variety of different factors. And as you can see on the map, um, the areas of Dark blue are areas of high opportunity, and the white areas are very low levels of opportunity. It's a gradient scale. And these 2015 maps really validated the lived experience of many people that already knew this, that had been living in the community, that when you lived west of the river, you didn't have access to opportunities, which is also where 98% of the black population in Dayton lived. And this is um, a direct correlation between what we're seeing in present day Dayton in 2015 um, to 1935 with redlining maps. I'm happy to explain redlining maps, but I also want to make this more interactive. Does anyone know what a redlining is or redlining maps? Ooh, we've got someone. You can't tell us. That's okay. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. What was your name? Tall. tall. Thank you, Tall. Yeah. Yes. I will repeat. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Tall. Uh, yeah. So in 1934, uh, the what, part of the New Deal, one of the things that got passed was the National Housing Act, which created opportunities for people to buy houses. This is what introduced the idea of a 30-year mortgage and a fixed rate, which we didn't have before. A lot of people in the US, though, now we think like white picket fence, owning a home, part of the American dream. That was really created um, as a result of this policy change in the 30s which was also created as a result of militant organizing that put political pressure on the administration to create these kinds of changes, which we'll talk about later.
later. Um, but in 1934, the federal government is now going to be backing mortgages. And as Tal said, the question is, well, you know, there are a lot of low income people who want now have access to potentially have housing. How are we going to make sure that we're assessing the risk? Because this is a huge investment of money and we need to make sure that um, we're, we're assessing the risk. So what they did was they created what we what they referred to at the time as risk assessment maps, which we now refer to as redlining maps, where they went into communities to assess the um, economic and structural makeup of a neighborhood as well as the social makeup of the neighborhood. But when you review the notes of these assessment maps, you find that they care very little about whether what the economic structures were um, in a community and far more about who lived in those communities. So there was a scale of A to D um, a being green, which are these are places that we should definitely be investing in. And um, if you got a, a, D, a D rating that's red, we should not invest there. And we will not invest there, as in the federal government will not back mortgages that are in these communities, which is driving political and, um, and political and economic decisions for the next 80 years, as we see. The thing, the number one thing that they cared about was who lived in those neighborhoods, um, and specifically if there were black people that lived in those neighborhoods. And if um, there was even one black family member living in a neighborhood, this is now considered a, um, a high risk neighborhood, and we will not invest here. If you, does anyone notice any trends between these two maps? White people lived in the green and black people lived in the red. What about between the two different maps, 1935 to 2015? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what was your name? What Melanie said was she's noticing the where the red area is west of the river is also where we're seeing the white part in the 2015, right? Where we're concentrating um, levels of uh, of risk instead of levels of opportunity. Was there another comment? Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't even doesn't even another layer of this, right? Like, where were they making decisions about putting highways in? Um, often forcing people out of their communities and out of their homes through um, uh, eminent domain. Yeah, tall. Yeah, for sure. So this was decisions, these were policy decisions that were made in the 30s. And while redlining is now very much illegal in terms of its functioning um, of you will not invest in, in, uh, in a neighborhood based off of race, one, it still happens. Um, but two, it often happens because of where capital was driven. So capital was driven and already existing in these green areas and then more capital drove them. So when um, you see mass disinvestment in Dayton, right, when you lose 40,000 manufacturing jobs and over 100,000 people leave the community, um, how that economic crisis is felt was disproportionately felt within the community. So all the grocery stores closed. And while we were working on this campaign to build, um, to build a, a grocery store, the hospital closed. And they're saying, this is, has nothing to do with race. It says, like, we're just going where the money is. We're just going where the profits are. We're just like, you know, we, we have incentives. Um, and I was talking to someone earlier today about this. Kroger or Stop and Shop or um, was it Ralph's? What are the grocery stores here? I don't remember. I haven't lived in New York in a minute. Um, what is it? King Collins, sure. All the grocery stores. They are in the business of not selling food. They're in the business of making money and they sell food to make money. So if I can make more money in another place with a higher profit margin, I'm gonna do that. But that leaves large swaths of communities without access to resources. So when folks saw this map, they were like, one, this isn't a surprise, we've been living this for a long time, but also what are we gonna do about it? Because Kroger's not coming back. NCR is not coming back. GM is not coming back. Um, when these decision makers were making these decisions, we were the most affected by them and we weren't at the decision making table. So we need to create institutions where we are the ones who are making the decisions about the institutions that affect our lives. 
So the Mondragon model was the model that we were looking towards and what I first saw in that presentation back um, uh, on that March evening in the Northwest Rec Center. And the Mondragon cooperative model comes out of um, Mondragon in Spain. And this started in the 30s with a small group of uh, folks who built a, I think it was a kerosene um, stove cooperative. It was like a small group of people. And over 20 years, um, they ended up building a co-op of co-ops. So they had a co-op bank. They had um, co-op grocery stores. They started building a micro um, ecosystem and a, a, an economic system that they owned. And it was based off of these cooperative principles. And I cannot read it because this is not small. Does anyone read any of those for me? Sovereignty of labor, education, I think there's like wage solidarity. Um, there are eight principles that you can see and I cannot, I am sorry, um, that, that really motivated this new model. And, and one of the unique things about the Mondragon system and, and the development of these co-ops was that it started in the Basque region of Spain um, after Franco's rise to power when the Basques had been fighting Franco. And he was just like, cool, you're not getting anything from me. Um, and they were facing all of these issues and they still um, were able to coordinate and, and not just focus on their needs, but really focus on the assets that they have to build these systems. So we saw that, yeah, NCR is not coming back. GM's not coming back. Well, we don't need y'all. Like we're gonna build our own, we're gonna build our own system, we're gonna build our own thing. And while Spain has had a lot of issues with um, unemployment and economic highs and lows, the, the region where Mondragon is strongest, which now still is worth billions of dollars and is made up of over 200 different co-ops, where I believe the highest paid individual of any of those co-ops only makes like eight times what the lowest paid worker makes, again, going back to these values of wage solidarity, has much lower levels of unemployment and has been able to um, weather a lot of these other economic storms that other areas haven't been because they built powers and institutions differently. So I was like, okay, I'm in. Like, what do y'all need me to do? <laughs> like, what, what, should I, what should I do here? And um, one of the most important things that I learned at the time was really to just like show up and listen to folks and, um, and try to be helpful where I could be and respond to the needs that were identified by those um, who were really leading this project because I was a newbie and I, who was I to tell folks what to do. And um, I had background in facilitation, so I started um, facilitating some of the community meetings. This, um, these are some pictures from our community-led mission statement process. And this is the, um, the mission statement of the Gem City Market that came out of hundreds of different community members coming together and talking about their visions for the store and talking about in 10 years when Gem City Market is a thing and it's successful and you're going there, what do you see? What do you feel? What is it like? Um, and the mission statement uh, says, our mission is to serve, engage, and empower our neighborhoods by providing affordable, high quality food in a clean and welcoming environment that is worker and community owned. It's super wordy. It's not the most concise mission statement, but that's also because it was created by hundreds of people um, coming together. And if I was writing that mission statement back then, or even now, I probably wouldn't have included the word clean. Like that wouldn't have been a priority for me necessarily. But the experience of the folks who were building the store was we deserve a clean and welcoming environment because every time we go to the Dollar General or when we go to the convenience store across the street, it is not clean and it is not welcoming and we deserve something different. And that came up so much in people's experiences when they were talking about it that it made it to the mission. And that's something that is orienting um, for the board of directors and for the general manager to always be returning to this mission statement because again, it was created by those that are most affected by this institution and the ones that were responsible for building it. So um, I started doing like community meeting work. We were hosting uh, uh, house parties, right? Like getting into people's homes, talking to them, having different people host events in the community, in their homes, talking about why this matters. Uh, we raised over $5 million to build this store. And as you'll see, even in the picture of, um, of the of the check usually when you have a picture of a check or when someone's receiving a check it's like a couple important people they're holding the check and it was like but this isn't a couple people receiving this check this is all of us receiving the check so we wanted that to to be reflected um similarly with our uh uh 
breaking ground ceremony. Or again, this is usually what a groundbreaking ceremony looks like. A couple people, sometimes the electeds, uh, sometimes the leaders of the organization, all, all shoveling. But one of the things that I was always asking myself in this work was how do we democratize what we're doing? If this really is our store, right? If this is ours and we, are, we own it together and we're responsible for its success and its failure, then in every aspect of our work, how are we democratizing um, what it is that we're doing? So we had a different kind of groundbreaking ceremony and we made sure that everyone had a shovel and everyone had a hat and it was a party for the community. Um, because when you wanna build something different, you have to think about doing things differently. So as I mentioned, I knew very little about building a grocery store. I like grocery stores, I like food, um, but that's kind of where my expertise was limited. But I did know a decent amount about how to bring people together, how to facilitate conversations, um, how to help people feel individual and collective ownership over our shared problems. And a lot of that came from my experience at Hofstra. Uh, so my first deliberative forum was in Professor Labresco's class, um, I, which I believe was Raising Engaged Citizens, is that what we think it was called? Um, which ended up being the, the um, I think the curriculum model for the CCE 101 class that y'all, some of y'all are in now. And it was the first time I'd ever been in a deliberative forum. And a deliberative forum um, in my experience was radically different than all other political conversations that I've been a part of, which were usually oriented on debates and winning and um, being right and having the right facts. And deliberation was about values and it was about trade-offs. Like, if you get this and this other bad thing happens, are you okay with that? Can you live with that trade-off? That's never something that I'd ever heard in our political rhetoric. Um, it was about people's lived experiences and personal experiences and their connections to those issues. Again, that's something that I had never really heard when we were talking about political, um, political debates, right? We're not talking about our own personal experiences, the right facts and the right things. But people are motivated, they make decisions about who to vote for or how to show up based off of emotion, often not on fact. Even if you think you're motivated by facts, you're actually still motivated by emotions. Um, so having emotional conversations is different and creating spaces where people feel comfortable having a different kind of conversation was really influential for me. So after um, having my first deliberative experience in Professor Labresco's class, I ended up having a few more at the end of my senior year. I have a vivid memory of, it was a Friday afternoon. It was like three weeks before graduation, four weeks before graduation. I think my thesis was due that week. Um, I was very tired. I did not want to go to the CCE event, which I was a CCE fellow. I knew it was for a project that I wasn't going to be a part of because I was about to graduate. And um, I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll go to this thing. I think there's food. And I, like most college students, am motivated by food and I didn't have much um, money on my, on my card. So I was like, okay, I'll go. Um, and it changed my life. Again, I go to a meeting that I wasn't expecting and it changed my life. That's where I met um, uh, Professor Michael DiNincenzo and had another uh, forum experience. And once again, felt like this is a different kind of talk and found out that there was just gonna be this project that was going on over the summer and then into the next year in response to the kind of problematic um, rhetoric that was both on campus and in the community in 2008 when we had hosted the first presidential debate that it was a lot of the spectator language, right? Like we're witnessing democracy as if democracy is two guys yelling at each other on stage. Um, and like, that's the pinnacle, right? That's the goal. So instead, how do we engage people in these conversations? How do we make um, democracy not a spectator sport, but something that people are doing together? So Professor DiNincenzo, um, was working on this project, the Deepening Democracy Through Deliberation Project, to facilitate an ambitious 100 deliberative forums on Long Island over the next year um, to really engage people in this democratic process. And I ended up getting hooked and I did some um, forums that summer and then ended up taking a position at the CCE, as Professor Bose mentioned, for the next year um, and help facilitate those discussions and train um, about two dozen undergraduate moderators to facilitate these conversations. And the, this changed, once again, changed my life. Really just like go to things where the food is, go to things when people invite you to meetings, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, it might give you a career, it might not. You might just be fed for the evening or make a friend. Um, 
But it was one of those instances where it was like this small thing that ended up that I, I got a feeling in my belly that like this is different and, and I want to try this. That later brought me to the Kettering Foundation a few years after that, um, where their main research question is how to make democracy work as it should. And I was actually working at the Kettering Foundation when I went to that meeting at the Northwest Rec Center. And it felt like everything that we were studying and talking about all the time, right? Community members coming together to address their um, shared needs and leverage the assets that they had. So instead of bringing people together who were doing this or talking about it or reading about it, I was like, cool, I get to do it. Yeah, I definitely want to do that. Um, and it was hard. Like, it's also really glamorous to like put a couple pictures on there and be like, oh, we did this and it's amazing. This was hard. Um, and it's still hard. Like the, the grocery store opened in May, but this, this past May, um, but it's still struggling, right? Like doing this work, building alternative systems is difficult. Um, and, it, and when you're wrestling with trade-offs, they're real trade-offs to make. At the time, I believe I mentioned, when we were building this door, our largest funder, the um, Premier Health, who had given $800,000 to the capital campaign, closed down a gr the last hospital on the west side while we're in the middle of this campaign. So we're fighting this disinvestment. Um, we're fighting all of these issues because of the health equity concerns that are happening in the community. And simultaneously, our largest funder, is, who we can't put on blast because our largest funder, we need the $800,000, is also closing a hospital um, in the community. So the tensions that came up on the board um, in community meetings, what does that response look like? How do we still engage? Um, is that, like, can we say no to the money? Can we not? Like, these were difficult questions that we had to figure out. Um, and there are things that are always going to come up when you're tackling big problems. I think not being scared of tackling those questions and again, rooting, um, always going back to what are our values and what are the trade-offs we are or aren't willing to make, make for much more productive conversations and often um, decisions that you feel more confident in because you anticipated the trade-off and you accepted that trade-off. My experience as an activist on campus um, and the training that I received and my early time at Hofstra through like Campus Camp Wellstone, um, my work at the Roosevelt Institute where I trained uh, college students on how to engage in um, creating progressive local um, campaigns and, um, and policy reform in their communities, all of that helped shape my understanding of power and became building blocks for my experience both with the Gem City Market as well as my work now as a labor organizer. And again, that started because like I think Again, I was really motivated by food. This is kind of embarrassing the more it's coming up and I say this. Um, like, I think the, the campus camp also, and like, I always wanted to like create a change, but then it was like, it's gonna be a weekend retreat and they were gonna feed us the whole time. And it sounded interesting, so I went and then like, I learned the basics of organizing. Uh, do you have a lot of speakers that are going to be coming through? As Athleen, I think, mentioned on the back, there is a whole table of places uh, or people that are coming in. You never know what you're going to learn at them. I really wish if I was going back in time, I went to all, all of them. I prioritized it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you all have to be here because you're in classes, so I appreciate you being here. Um, but even the ones that you don't have to go to would recommend that you go because, again, the exposures that you have here, um, you don't have elsewhere. Like, I wish that I lived near a university now where I could go to more of the, um, the events on campus that I don't have access to in the same way. Another thing that I learned at Hofstra, um, this Kendrick Lamar had not come out with the song yet. I think this was 2017, long after I graduated. Um, but uh, Professor Maney, Greg Maney, uh, who at the time ran the Civic Engagement Center for Civic Engagement, made it very clear to CCE fellows that we needed to be humble, and and listen, and and that's that was our role when we were working in community was to not go in trying to serve people or help people or make assumptions about what folks need, but to be in solidarity with folks, to sit and ask questions first. Um, because there are a lot of assumptions that are made when um, you're going and trying to help people. There are a lot of assumptions made when you're working in communities where you're not in relationship to people. And that was probably one of the most important things that I learned at my time at Hofstra was to be humble and sit down when I'm engaging in new spaces. Um, because you're able to do more transformative work when you're in relationship with people. And the only way to be in relationship with people is to ask them questions about who they are and to hold space for them to actually answer those questions instead of making assumptions about what you think they might need or what you could offer, um, what you could offer them. 
And throughout my career, when I've been in decision-making rooms, um, despite my learning that you should be humble and sit down and not make assumptions about people, and most of the times where I've been in rooms with decision-makers, um, that is not how folks engage. And the those that are most affected by issues are often not the ones at the decision-making table. I've found myself throughout my career mostly in rooms of middle-class and wealthy white people. Um, who are not often affected by, in the same way by the, um, by the decisions that they're making. In political spaces, they tend to be more male, and, um, and the more in political spaces and the, the higher up you go, right, like when I'm sitting with members of Congress um, versus when I'm sitting with local electeds, the wealthier they get as well. Um, and in nonprofit spaces, it tends to be more women, but it's still largely rooms of middle class, white, and wealthy people who are often making decisions. Um, and there are consequences of having those that are most affected not at the decision-making table. And I saw this show up in my work all of the time. I remember the first time I went to a statewide um, convening table. So these were like all of the organizations of political, progressive, self-identified progressive organizations that are making decisions about what races they were gonna prioritize. I think it was in 2020. Um, so this was like a meeting in 2019. I was pretty new to my role and I was like, cool, okay, like I'm gonna learn all the things. Like this, these are like, these are important people. Um, and this is in Ohio, mind you. And I walk in and I'm like one of two people of color in the room. Um, there were no black people in the room. This is Ohio. And these are all the folks making decisions about where the left and where progressives should be investing. And we lose in Ohio a lot. And a big reason why is because we're not centering those that are most affected by these issues um, when we're making decisions about what campaigns we want or what the messaging looks like or what candidates are worthy of investment. This also happened when I was in nonprofit organizations, when I was doing food equity work, that you had all of these people who were not experiencing food insecurity making decisions about policies that were supposed to be supporting people experiencing food insecurity. We, they just weren't part of the conversation. Or maybe they would do like one listening meeting um, and then like take those insights or they'd hire someone to do a listening meeting and take insights instead of really centering those voices and hiring an organizer. Like why can't um, the county hire an organizer to build with and engage with people who are experiencing food insecurity and bring them as part of that decision-making process of what they want to do and what they want to see. And not just in a way where they're like giving their voice and then someone else makes that decision, but actually be in the decision making bodies be part of those advisory boards um, and 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 that comes up in language that you that I saw often in these rooms especially again going back to food insecurity talking about the hungry food deserts as um, which is the official term for people who are living in an area without access to um, affordable affordable food anti-hunger organizations right versus people experiencing food insecurity, centering their existence as a person with an issue versus the hungry. Um, food apartheid, the food desert implies that this is a natural phenomenon, right? Like, oh, deserts, it's what, it just happened. No, this is a result of policy changes. We saw that, we saw that on the maps. This is something that we decided it's gonna happen. So if we're not using specific language that acknowledges the problem, then how are we supposed to address it? How are we actually supposed to deal with the root issue unless we're actually acknowledging what that issue is? Um, Anti-hunger is, yes, people are hungry, but when people are feeling hungry or they're experiencing food insecurity, they're also experiencing a lot of other things. I found in my work that people don't experience food insecurity in a vacuum. And it, actually, this is a conversation about justice. This is a conversation about equity. This is a conversation about like economics. People have enough money, they make good wages, then they don't have to worry about buying food. Right? If you have access to transportation, then you can drive to a grocery store that might not be um, within a mile of where you live. But if you don't have those things, uh, there's probably a reason why, and it goes back to these structures. So when we use language, we have to be mindful of what the power is in that language, um, where our positioning is in that, and how we are centering those that are most affected. This also, I think, is something that um, Professor Maney helped me think about back when I was a student, but that has continued to grow of not going from a place of helping um, or being an ally or a voice for the voiceless, which I think shows up a lot in advocate spaces, um, but instead shifting to being in solidarity with people, to being not just an ally, but a co-conspirator, that it's not just I support you, but like I too have something to lose. I too am putting myself on the line with you. 
um, that we're not the voice for the voiceless. People aren't voiceless. People have voices. They have experiences. The question is, are, are folks listening? Do they have the mic? Are they in the room? So if I have the mic, am I passing it? If I'm in the room, who am I bringing with me? Or who am I subbing out for? Because maybe it doesn't make sense for me to be there. It doesn't make sense for me to give the speech. Even if I've heard all of the stories, what it makes sense is, is making sure that the person who is affected by this feels prepared and confident in their story. And I'm spending all my time prepping them and making sure they feel confident and they're leading instead of me. Even if I could speak, even if I could do it, should I be doing it? Am I the right person to be in the front? Um, Fannie Lou Hamer said, nobody's free until everybody's free. How does that show up in our work? How does that show up of the difference between being, again, an ally or a co-conspirator? And when we center those that are most affected by issues, when the people who are closest to the pain are closest to the power, we have different outcomes. Does anyone know who this is? That's okay. Who is she? Congresswoman Bush, Congresswoman Cori Bush. Um, she is the Congresswoman from St. Louis and uh, she was a Black Lives Matter activist. She got her start in organizing um, back in the, uh, the uprisings with Ferguson BLM. She is a pastor, she is a nurse, she is a single mother and she has been evicted three times. So when she was a Congresswoman, and this past summer, uh, it, the moratorium on evictions was ending. And this was also around the time that Congress was about to go into their summer recess. They're about to get seven weeks of, of recess, vacation, summer vacation. And the moratorium was ending. And there was some discussion about it, but there was a lot of political infighting, right? So Pelosi was like, I don't have these votes. Biden, you need to um, uh, have an executive order extending the ban. He's like, no, I can't do that. It's not going to go through the courts. They're, they're fighting about it. And then it's just kind of like, oh, well, time's up. We couldn't do anything. We're all going to go home. Like, it's recess. And Cory Bush was like, I'm not going home. I've been evicted three times. I remember how scared I was living in my Jeep and I am not going to let another person feel that way. And I know that there are many people around this country that I took an oath to represent that are going to feel that way. So she staged a sit-in and she slept on the steps of the Capitol for days. And in doing so, she, um, she got some of her friends, other members of the squad came and supported her. Other folks started to come. Um, they got press around it and they created enough political pressure to force Biden to, um, to write an executive order extending the moratorium. And his fears around the courts were real, right? Like it got rejected in the courts, but it also bought time for the millions of dollars that already were out there um, for folks to be able to get rental assistance because they had all of this money that wasn't being distributed and they needed more time to get it distributed. That wouldn't have happened if she didn't prioritize that issue. She was literally the only member of Congress who didn't go home. And she was the only member of Congress because she's the only member of Congress that had been evicted three times. When we center those that are closest to the pain to be closest to the power, we can lead transformatively. It is easier to, to go home. It is easier to let an issue go when you're an ally and you see someone else struggling, but it's not your struggle. When you, when you adopt that as your struggle, when you support those that are most affected and put them in positions of leadership, what we prioritize fundamentally changes. So that's what I've been trying to do in my career. Um, I now have the unique opportunity to make a living wage working with working class folks fighting, um, fighting for their power. Uh, I work, as um, Professor Bose mentioned, as the political and legislative um, uh, in the political and legislative department at IUECWA, and we represent manufacturing workers. And this is just um, some pictures of of recent campaigns. Oh, there was supposed to be a picture in the corner. Um, that's okay. It was just a great picture of people fighting for the Pro Act. We can talk about the Pro Act. It's it's exciting. Um, but I get to I get to spend my I make a living wage fighting with and for working class people. And, um, and, and not being the one in, it's actually really unique for me to be up here talking. Um, I completely changed what I was saying last night or what I had prepared to say today uh, because I feel very uncomfortable talking about myself. Um, and that's not what I get paid to do. What I get paid to do is listening to other people and giving them the skills to be able to 
and the tools to be able to speak their own stories and advocate for themselves. So on the top left hand corner, um, you'll see a group of general electric workers who are fighting for reinvestment. They're trying to put pressure on the company to reinvest in their domestic facilities. Um, they've seen tens of thousands of their jobs go away and their communities destroyed. And they're like, no, these taxpayer dollars go to GE. They, we give them billions of dollars every year. We deserve to have that money reinvested in our community. Um, below that, you'll see folks, um, some of our members in Dayton who were uh, advocating for Amy Cox, who was a union member who was running for office because she was like, we need more working class people in office. They're not prioritizing our issues. So unless we're running, um, we're not gonna win. Uh, similarly, um, on the other side, you see a group of folks who are public sector workers in Rochester, New York, um, with one of their elected officials that they're lobbying um, to try to change, because they're public sector workers, they uniquely get to elect their boss, um, and trying to change uh, the makeup of the administration so that they could get a contract, because they had been working eight years without a contract because they had an administrator that was super anti-worker and they ended up doing enough organizing work that they flipped the ledge and um, they elected a pro-worker county administrator for the first time in over 30 years. So I am lucky. Um, I'm lucky that I got to go to a place like Hofstra where I was supported by faculty um, and had institutions like the Center for Civic Engagement and Honors College and departments like political science and global studies and geography that supported my leadership. Um, and I got to I got to try a lot of different things and I was inspired by a lot of different folks. But the biggest thing that I learned was when you center that those that are most affected, when you follow where the power actually is, and when you trust in people's abilities to solve their own problems, if they're given the tools to do so, then you can do really transformative work. Um, so as I mentioned, happy to uh, say that the Gem City Market is a thing, that there is now a grocery store on the west side, and there's only one, and that's still not enough for 40,000 people, but this one is owned by the community and the workers. This one centers those that are most affected. The top left-hand corner is a picture of the annual member meeting where folks were um, voting on, on some big decisions about the store, and the bottom right is the actual store. So if you ever find yourself in Dayton, Ohio, it's on Salem Avenue, corner of Salem and Superior on the west side. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's, a special, it's a special place. And it was built by folks like you who recognize an issue in their community and decided that they wanted to do something about it. And that's all I got. I was told that there would be questions. There's a mic. Constructive um, and really passionate and inspiring talk. We're going to ask that anyone who has questions to please come to the mic. That way it will be included in the recording. Um, we'd like to give priority to students, um, and I know there are many here. So if you want to come up behind me, I'll just take the liberty while people are coming up to, of asking the first question, um, which is this, Atana. We, you've spoken a lot about the importance of language and listening. And listening takes time. And the American political system, so as someone who studies institutions, ha is not particularly flexible with time, right? We have midterm elections coming up in November. We'll have another presidential election, right? We don't have a, we don't have a system of votes of no confidence. How do you balance the transformative goals that you're discussing with the current politi the political system in the United States? And, and how do you make those choices of perhaps building advocacy, supporting candidates who may not win, but are the next cycle, but mm -hmm. could win down the road? How do you balance the immediate and the long term? It's a good question, loaded with trade-offs that I struggle with all the time. Thanks, um, thanks for that question. So I think the first thing that, that came up for me when you were saying that is the long way is the short way. There are no shortcuts for this. And every time we try to make shortcuts, we lose. Like it doesn't work. So right now I'm working on that General Electric campaign that I mentioned and um, I shared this anecdote in another class, so apologies if this is redundant for some folks. But um, General Electric is pinching pennies off the backs of their workers, even though they not only get billions of dollars in tax breaks and are um, a multi-billion dollar company, 
but also as a company that um, that is supposed to pay their workers benefits and now they're reneging on some of those. So right now there are workers that work at GE that are, um, that they're eligible dependents. So like their family members, you know, their kids, their spouses are getting kicked off of their insurance. And um, they're finding out when they go to the hospital and they find out they don't have coverage anymore. Or when they get a bill after they went to the doctor's office and they find out that they're not insured. So this is something that's like clearly very upsetting for many people. They're putting a petition together um, and they start having conversations on the shop floor because they need to put pressure up. We only have a very limited time to like get this petition to be able to escalate. And no one's signing the petition. Like very few people are signing the petition. I'm talking to my activists like, okay, well, how are your conversations going? And they're like, well, I just, I was like, okay, so like, what are you hearing on the shop floor? They're like, well, you know, like they, they are struggling with the QR code, like they can't put it in or like they don't want their information to like be on the internet. And I was like, okay, well, how did, like, what did you ask? Like, like how, how are things going with them? What's their experience with healthcare? Well, I didn't ask them that, I asked them to sign the petition. It's like, okay, well, if you're not talking to them and you don't know what they care about and you're just telling them to do something, then they're probably not going to do it and they're not going to feel invested in this issue. So you need to have a different kind of conversation. So even though we are time strapped, we are also failing and not able to do the things that we want to do because we're not doing the work. And you had mentioned like candidates that won't necessarily win now. I do think it's important to like see good candidates. I think um, even if they don't win in this cycle, some organizations I think do some really unique things around their endorsements or they're like, this is someone that we're endorsing. I can't remember the language of this organization in North Carolina that does this, but they're basically like, there are two different kinds of endorsements. This person we actually endorse and we think they're a transformative candidate that actually is gonna fight for us. And this person, we like better than the other person, but we don't like them as much, but we are going to endorse them because we want them to win. Um, and, and being transparent about that and talking to their membership about that of, we're going to put more pressure on this person. Yes, we're endorsing them. And I think this came up like with Biden and Trump versus some of the um, local races that they were that they were fighting for. But they're like, yeah, we're going to endorse Biden, but we're going to hold his toes to the fire. We're endorsing him. We're holding his toes to the fire. And this person we're actually going to spend more time investing in because we believe in their candidacy and we believe that they're going to fight for us. So I think it's laden with trade-offs. Um, and every time we try to do a shortcut, we lose. And I think that's why right now um, we don't have the Build Back Better Act. Like we don't have the political will right now to get this through, even though um, it's part of the Biden administration's agenda, even though we're talking about this, because I think we've made a lot of shortcuts in terms of being clear about what that narrative is, being clear about what we're willing to fight for and holding the line in ways that I think the Republican Party often does a better job than the Democratic Party. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm hoping some students. Yeah, come, come on, here. students. Oh, they're waiting for me to finish. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. Give me some questions. I'm first. Um, Can you say I, your name and what yeah. you're majoring in? Um, I'm Melanie. I am a double major in global studies and public policy, and I want to get a minor in management. Cool. Um, also, my long-term goal is education reform. And I wanted to ask you about, well, first of all, thank you. This was a great talk. Um, but how do you think that we can educate more people and like make more people understand that the important thing to do is like to listen and to empower other people? who don't have the kind of power instead of just like taking power for ourselves? Mm, good question. Um, I think it starts with engaging with people in a different way. Like it's one thing to be like, you should listen and another of like modeling that behavior. Um, so I think a big part of this is by modeling the behavior that we want to see change. A lot of times when I do um, trainings with, with members or college students or whoever I, I've worked with in the past, we'll talk about an issue and they're like, only if people understood, we just got to go out there with some flyers and educate people. Like if only people knew. And it's not that people don't necessarily know, it's that they're not brought into the process. Um, we were talking earlier in another class about healthcare and access to healthcare and people's experiences. And like the first thing I asked when some folks were sharing their experiences was how did that feel? How did it feel, like how does it feel to have to pay $250 for um, medication that you need to stay alive and knowing that other people in other countries only have to pay $5 for that same medication? How does that feel? 
does it have to be that way? Do you think it could be a different way? Um, I think the way that we engage with people when we're having those kinds of conversations matters. And if we focus on organizing, which is about building relationships with people and building power out of those relationships versus just mobilizing, which is like getting people in a room to do the thing or getting them to vote, kind of just like saying, this is the thing that we need people to do. Let's go do that versus what do we want to do together? Create space for um, different kinds of outcomes. I Thank hope that's you. helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Logan, political science major, minor in philosophy and public relations. Um, so my question is like you're saying, um, you mentioned how like um, people in Congress, like the woman who like stayed out there, Clay like Bush. because she knows. So if we. Do you think it's possible within our political system today to get more people elected to that? Or do you think it's going to be more of like starting with a smaller like community based and then outreaching? Because it's so polarized today. Would it even be possible to get these people and all the people in power are backed by so much money to be able to do that? It's a great question. I think so. Um, I know a lot of people think I'm naive, but I don't agree. I think that we have different theories of change and power analysis. I think that most people don't vote. Data shows most people don't vote. Most people don't vote because they don't think it matters. They don't think it affects their lives. Um, and when you tell them it does, they're like, leave me alone. Like the, when we don't, when we just call people and say, you should vote for this person. Why? Because I said so, because I care about it, because whatever. Why would I feel motivated to do that? When you have conversations with people that are transformative, when you're actually engaging with people about issues that they care about and helping them connect those experiences, not telling them they should be angry, not telling them they're not voting in their interest or doing something in their interest, but engaging them engaging with them in a way where you now understand what they care about and you're able to ask questions that help them make those connections, it can be transformative. And I've had those kinds of conversations politically with folks um, through this deep canvassing project um, that we're working on right now at, at IUE and that other organizations have been doing. Highly recommend if folks are interested in deep canvassing to look up people's action work online. You can even um, like participate in, um, in a deep canvas phone bank remotely. And it's a different kind of conversation that's rooted in people's stories and asking people how they're doing and asking how they feel about an issue and asking them why they feel that way. And then moving to, to whatever the political, um, like, you know, the campaign candidate is. And I really do think that if we have those kind of transformative conversations, we can have more transformative leaders and we can have more transformative politics, but we cannot expect the current system to do anything different than what it is designed to do. So as long as we're focused on GOTV and turning people out, um, which we see all the time, like when do folks go out into black communities two weeks before the election, a month before the election? When are we investing in leadership in that community beforehand? When are we actually seeing um, black and working class voters as voters Voters who are persuadable versus just the assumed base. No one's asking students how they feel about an issue. They just assume you're young, you're liberal, okay, come out. Like, let's just do GOTV at the end. Um, engaging everyone as if they're a persuadable voter, engaging everyone by actually asking them what they care about, I think fundamentally can change politics. And we're already spending a bunch of money on it. Like, we're already doing a bunch of work. We're already knocking a bunch of doors. Why don't we just have a different conversation on the doors? I guess that's, uh, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Logan. Hello, my name is Colin. I am a political science major uh, with a focus on pre-law. And my question is, what is your opinion or your advice on creating a transformative institution or union that might deal with certain issues that are not just community-based, but um, human rights issues that focus more on maybe a state level or a national level? Um, and I just have a specific example of creating a transformative institution that may combat something like human trafficking mm -hmm. and something where maybe money isn't the main priority, but rather the more moral and ethical priority. And how would you get people to uh, support that in a transformative um, situation? Okay. So trafficking, I want to make sure I understand this question correctly. So. Um, doing work around like trafficking or like larger larger human rights questions how do you um, how do you get people to care about it or how, what was the what how is, do you how do you kind of create a transformative union or um, institution that makes that the main priority focus because um, I realize in your experiences it's very seems uh, community based and mm -hmm. very um, you know when there's an issue that a community is facing getting a community together and figuring out how do you change that 
Um, so I guess my two parts to the question are, can you create a transformative institution for something um, not just based in a community? Because mm -hmm. um, I imagine in a community, you might have uh, a minority of people who have had personal experiences with human trafficking, but it can still be a very important ethical issue. Um, and can you then, ex my second part of the question is, can you expand that into a kind of national interest or a state interest or something bigger than just in a community? For sure. So I think the first part of that question, like how do you build a transformative institution is like you do work differently. Like right. you focus on transformative change by engaging with people in a different way. So a lot of progressive organizations and nonprofit organizations that love labor and support labor and whatever, when their workers want to unionize, they're like, oh no, like you can come to us. Like they'll, they'll run anti-union campaigns. This happens all the time. Um, so if you want to do things differently, you have to do things differently. So if you're interested in respecting labor of folks and in like generally, then how does that show up in your organization? Um, if you're focused on human rights uh, and healthcare is a human right, how are you providing benefits or healthcare for folks? So I think part of it starts with like actually living the values of the stated organization within the organization, which often doesn't happen, especially in nonprofits that focus Real, that are really exploitative. Like it's a very exploitative model and it relies on, oh, well, you care about the world, so you shouldn't be able to make your bills. That's okay because you feel good after you go home. No, when I go home, I'm tired and I want to be able to like not worry about these things, but you can't. So I think part of it is like living those values no matter what the organization is. And then um, in terms of your second question, I don't have a good answer for that other than like, all issues are local. So like even though trafficking happens all over the world, like you have people who are trafficked locally. Um, and thinking about what are the connections to this community um, or what um, why why does this matter to folks here is something that you need to be asking yourself. And like why is this the issue? Is it because um, you're inspired generally by it? Is it because this community's experiencing something? Trafficking happens in a lot of different ways. Um, so like if you're talking about sex trafficking, well, what's our engagement with sex workers in this community? Um, what like it becomes much bigger uh, when you're looking at the lent, like what it is that you care about with this issue versus just um, focusing on what the perceived issue is, if that makes sense. Yep, it does. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Weston. I'm a labor studies and drama double major. Labor studies! Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so my question is, um, especially uh, within uh, white working class populations, they make up a pretty significant amount of power for the Republican Party. And um, so my question would be, what are ways to introduce uh, progressive legislation and uh, progressive uh, institutions in a way that um, Republicans, uh, especially white working class Republicans, tend to be pretty hesitant of or have a lot of inf misinformation towards? What are ways to uh, introduce these kind of uh, movements um, to make it more uh, understandable and uh, digestible? For sure. So I deal with this all the time. A lot of my, so I work in a manufacturing union. A lot of our members are um, white men. A lot of them are Republicans and not gonna lie, this is just this is just really hard. Like, and especially in the the hyper partisanship that we're experiencing now, which has been ever increasing. Um, it was uh, things were already really partisan when I was a freshman in college during the debate in 08, but it was it's very different now. Um, so I'm not gonna pretend like this is easy. I will go back to the long way is the short way. I do think that we need to have conversations with folks. Um, we're not in relationship. So like if you're looking at, you know, working class um, white communities or when we're looking at uh, specifically, you know, union members, the relationship between members and the union has really changed over the years. The union hall used to be a place where people came and felt community with each other and there was a connection um, to that institution and there was trust. And that changed over the years. And a big part of that was we focused on representation versus organizing. It was about someone making the, like, making the big decision or going to fight the boss versus all of us doing that. And I think any time that we can bring people in for our fights, it matters. Um, and also talking to people about what their issues are and, um, and what they care about. Going back to the deep canvas model, having a conversation with someone about what their issues are, oftentimes, whether they're Republican or Democrat, like people think that workers, that it's hard to be a working class person these days, right? And who the enemy is changes. 
Um, but that feeling is real. And until we validate those feelings and we have conversations that are rooted in those feelings and those experiences and then connect to the structures, I think is one piece. And then the second, and I feel um, like I'm in a unique position working at a union, as I often say to my members, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I care about whether or not you're good on our issues because there are a lot of corporate Democrats that don't care about these issues and a lot of corporate Republicans that don't care about these issues. It's two Democrats that are holding up the Build Back Better Act, not the Republicans. Um, so being honest about that and not just saying that this is a partisanship thing or this party is all good or this party is all bad, but really who are they motivated by, what are those interests, um, is a big part of that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Hello, so my name is Tal, and I'm a double major in public policy and um, English and a minor in psychology. And uh, my future goal is to go to women's advocacy in, in the home and the workforce. Uh, so mine's sort of like a two um, question part. Uh, the first is, how would you start in trying to change a harmful policy that has been around for many years? And what would you do if your opponent is a powerful person or institution? Okay, um, so power. So the opponent is powerful institution. Usually, all harmful policies, the opponent is going to be someone powerful. Um, so I. So what would I do if I was trying to to, to change it? To change it, um, I would start with the power map. Um, I don't know how to visually show this. So it's like a grid where I'm looking at who has, so I'm gonna start mapping people out on an X, Y axis. Um, the top of the, I don't know if this is X or Y, I didn't do well in math or haven't taken a math class. Y, cool, thank you, thanks math, or not math. Uh, Professor Prati's not a math teacher, but just knows this. So top of the Y axis is um, their people's, Ooh, people's access to power, right? Who has the power to make the decision about this? Um, so the top of the axis is who has the most power, bottom of the axis is who has the least power. And then on the X axis, um, who is with me, who are my supporters, and who's against me? And I wanna map everyone out, and not just groups of people, but individual people on this map. Um, so I have a better sense of the landscape and can assess who I want to engage with and what that looks like. Um, because a lot of times we get uh, caught up in spending a lot of time on um, people who aren't actually, don't have that much influence, but they're against us. Um, and we don't focus on maybe supporters who have less power, but maybe they have power to leverage over someone else. So I think first it starts with like looking at the landscape. And then the second is figuring out who is with me and how do I build power out of that group of people? Because as long as you're trying to do something on your own, you will likely fail um, or it won't last longer than you, especially if the fight is something that um, is going to take time. And when you're doing stuff in college, like semesters end, people graduate, they study abroad. And if the work is really focused on just you, then it will like live and die with just you. So always trying to build your coalition. One thing that I learned um, pretty early on in my career is um, that People in positions of power only do what is politically possible, but what pl is politically possible can change. So some it might not be possible for you to win this reform right now with the way that the power map exists, but if you can move people on that map by engaging in a lot of different actions, um, which could be protests, it could be um, you know conversations, it could be testimony, it could be one-on-one -on -one conversations, it, there's a w million ways to run a campaign, you can change, you can change the map. And if you can change the map, then you can change what's politically possible. Um, so you can change opposition, you can neutralize opposition, or you can put enough pressure on them, like Cori Bush did with Biden, um, to, to, create, um, to, to create change that you wanna see. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tal. Uh, I'm Patrick, and Hi, I'm Patrick. a political science major. And uh, I got two questions. My first question is, do you think that the US government should be either funding or taking control of these co-ops and promoting them all across the nation to help relieve the economic suffering and promote equality in this nation? And my second question is, in a post-NAFTA world, do you think it is capable of the United States to rebuild the labor unions that the United States once had that helped create the middle class to begin with? Two interesting questions. Okay, the first is about nationalization of co-ops. Is that what you said? Either funding or nationalization of co-ops. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there should be funding for this kind of work. And you see this in other countries, um, especially in Latin America and socialist countries in Latin America, where they're like, cool, you want to build a, a, a school or you want to build this community group or this community center, or you want to build whatever, we'll give you the resources, you find the labor. 
Like, you all are going to organize in your community, and we will give you the resources to do it, but, like, there needs to be will in this community to do so. Um, it was really hard to have to go to a bunch of um, rich people who are not affected by this issue and try to make the plea that they should give this money. It would have been a lot better if we could get a lot more dollars from the federal and state government. So I think that, yes, funding these kinds of models could be really transformative. I would argue that they don't need to be nationalized in the sense that I don't think the co-ops need to be nationalized. I think funding should be there. But why not have um, national, like, na we should have nationalized, I believe that we should have nationalized health care. Everyone should have access to it. So all the hospitals can just be owned by the government and run by the government. Why not have the same with, um, with grocery stores? Things that people need to survive should not be dictated by market gaps that are created by capitalism. The, the, the maps that we showed created all of these market gaps. They were intentionally created by the government. Why should the government not be responsible for fixing those gaps? But in ways that we can always be centering those that are most affected, which is why I like the co-op model, right? That the people who are shopping at the store, the people who work at the store, the ones making the decisions, I think is even more powerful than our current form of representative government of them running it. And then the second question around NAFTA, hell yeah, I think that we can build back um, the labor movement. And also the majority of workers in this country are not manufacturing workers. And I am like uniquely positioned to care about and want to invest in um, reindustrialization in the US. But unions are not just for people in factories. Every worker deserves a union. And a lot of times people think that unions are just for other people. Um, Cause like I work at a good job, I don't need a union. Well likelihood of any job that you have, unless you're in a union, is you have an at-will contract. It means they can fire you for any reason, any reason that is not legally um, illegal or like not legally opposed. So they can't fire you for your gender. Or they can't fire you for um, your race if you can prove those things. But they can fire you because they don't like that sweater. They can fire you because they don't like that attitude. And there's no recourse. Um, the thing that I love most about unions is it gives us space to build power with the people that we spend the most time with, right? Often our colleagues in our workplace. And it's democracy in the workplace. It's not just about things not being good or not getting paid enough, though that's often an issue. And it's also about how we show up with and for each other and how we have power in dictating the rules of how we're treated. Um, and I think there's a lot of space for that and that there's a growing interest in unions that we're seeing right now. Unfortunately, we don't have the laws that make it fair to, to be able to organize a union. And anyone who is following what's happening in Amazon um, in Bessemer, Alabama, you see that, that it is not that workers don't want a union. 48% of workers in the US who don't have a union want them, but less than 10% of workers are actually unionized. And that is because bosses run anti-union campaigns that are incredibly both illegal and immoral. Um, and they're, they're able to do that without recourse, which is why we need the PRO Act. So Google the PRO Act, the Protect the Right to Organize Act, which won't get passed until either we have different people um, in, in Congress or we get rid of the filibuster. But I do think that's possible. And I also think that we need um, both mass protests, militant organizing on the shop floor and um, in the streets as to, to create the political pressure to, to change what's possible. Also, uh, just one last thing. What do you think the U.S. could do to help promote democracy, not just inside of government, but also, and not just inside of labor unions, but inside of co other corporations and in more in schools? Because you mentioned how you weren't really exposed to this type of thing until you went to these type of meetings. How can we pr be promoting democracy in a high school and get educate people more of how democracy works, with especially with people not voting on mass? Yeah, um, I think civics is really important and it's not required. I believe New York, they call it the pigs class, I think I remember, like participation in government, which is not the greatest name. Um, but it's it's unique that it's required here. So I think teaching civics is really important. Um, you saw a very intentional um, shift after the 1970s in the Powell Memo. Write down the Powell Memo. Even forget about the PRO Act. Write down the Powell Memo. Google the Powell Memo. I don't have time to talk about it now, but it is the... Um, it is the roadmap for corporations and how they built power over the last um, 40 years or 50 years, really. And one of the things that they very intentionally did was take labor history out of um, out of out, out of history classes. I think you're similarly seeing this with these ridiculous debates around critical race theory and not not having real conversations about our deeply racist history. This country was founded on colonialism, um, we, we genocide and slavery. Like that's 
that's the origin of this country. We should be able to talk about it. Um, and we should also be able to talk about the wins that people of color have had, the wins that working people have had. And when we strip those from our history books and we're not able to really engage with them, I think it's much harder to, to think that these things are politically possible. Um, so again, I think it's like changing what we teach and also why shouldn't students be on the, like have students represented on their school boards, um, have workers represented on, uh, on board of like board of directors, um, I think it's also about shifting those those uh, institutions and who sits at the table and teachers on on um, on uh, what is it called school board. Thank you. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for your questions. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Joani. My major is rhetoric and public advocacy, and um, well, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, well, East New York. And I was in a community where it was oversaturated with fast food restaurants and bodegas with fatty foods. So nothing really healthy. But what amazed me was that there are communities with zero supermarkets and zero like hospitals, where you were saying, for, with Ohio. Um, and my question to you is that, do you feel like there should be government intervention? Should the government require states to have a minimum of su um, supermarkets or hospitals or requirements? And if so, do you feel like it's feasible in this current social climate? I think our social climate is changing. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's enough, as Anna mentioned, if there's enough political will, why not? Like, why shouldn't we have those things? Again, I believe that, or just believe, I've seen that we created these problems, right? Like the market, we talk about like a market gap, right? Like the market is just this magical thing. No, we created the market. The federal government put billions of dollars in investment in some communities and, and took it out of other communities. So when the government is responsible for making these problems, um, then we should be part of figuring out what those solutions are. Uh, so I don't know um, from a policy level if it's um, requiring a certain number of grocery stores, uh, but if we are talking about requiring grocery stores, I think it's also important to regulate those markets um, because I was having a conversation um, earlier today about like on campus, the, the food is expensive here, and it's still expensive, and it's been expensive since I went to school here. And my understanding, though I could be wrong, is that it's privatized. It is a company that, that sells this. And y'all are a captive audience, so you have to pay a dollar or a dollar twenty-five for the banana, because otherwise you don't have a banana, because many of you probably don't have a car. You can't drive to the grocery store to get a banana. Um, so why does that exist in that way? Like, it doesn't have to be that way. We could say, no, you can't charge more than 25 cents for a banana. Like, that's just the way it's gonna work. Or it can't cost this much more over cost because we're not focused on profit. We're focused on making sure that there is healthy food for, for the community. So I think going back to asking ourselves, like, who stands to gain in this and what is the purpose of this institution um, is really important, especially when you're talking about, like, a grocery store they're, they're not in the business of selling food, they're in the business of making money. They sell food to make money, which is different than just being in the business to sell food like, the, like um, Gen City Market does. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there, my name's Eddie Fitz. I'm a journalism major uh, with a minor in, ooh, sorry, with a minor in political science and civic engagement. And uh, my question is one of the, uh, have you experienced issues with the amount of time that people are just working, that they don't have time in local communities to be able to, to go out and, and build a grocery store, to be able to do these things. Uh, and then to that second point, uh, you've sort of been dancing around it, the, the prosperity over, over profit I ideology. Uh, do you feel like that could create some concern in this uh, idea that we might become too individualized, that, that we wouldn't be, that it, it's so easy now for us to be able to order uh, something from Amazon in California and it gets to my steps in Uniondale, that, that we'd be somehow sacrificing the uh, simplicity of our lives right now? It's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, the first one, yes, like people are busy. Um, right. Many of my members work multiple jobs. Many of the people that I was building the grocery store with worked multiple jobs and they took care of, um, they took care of their families. And they also showed up. So... 
I get really frustrated when people are like, oh, I don't have time for this or like, oh, I can't like I've got this thing going on when I've got when I've got Mika who's showing up, who's working a mandatory 12 every day, six days a week. And she's taking care of her two grandbabies and she's taking care of her um, partner who's recovering from COVID. And she's still showing up for the meeting because she believes in this. Like, I don't want to hear your excuses. People will show up when they feel like this is something that matters to them when they see their liberation as part of this. So I think part of it is like, this is not a priority. I'm not going to sign the petition if this isn't my issue. I'm not going to show up to the meeting if this isn't my issue or I have other things going on. But people will show up for things that they care about. And often the people who are doing a lot of that work are black women who are also experiencing all of these issues that we're talking about in a patriarchal, racist, um, uh, capitalistic environment. So if they're showing up to do the work, you better believe I'm going to show up with them and encourage other folks to step up in that way. In terms of the individualism, yeah, I think that's definitely an issue. And I also think that people are craving um, community right now and people are craving connection. And we've been so alone for so long that there are opportunities. Like I felt, I remember being out in the streets um, last May and, or was it last May, May before, like 2020. And um, feeling really overwhelmed because I had been so alone for so long and then all of a sudden I was in crowds with people um, and it felt really good. Like it just felt good to be with other folks. So I think um, figuring out how to create those spaces and making sure whatever the work that you're doing that you're always inviting people to the table and centering their own buy-in with this uh, really really is a way to, to do work more transformatively. Thank you very much. Yeah. We have two more questions, and I think we're going to try to get them both in. So. Okay, I will be brief with my responses, hopefully. As I begin to conclude, as some people might have heard from Professor DiNincenzo. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jordan. I'm a chemistry major and a education major here. Hi, Jordan. And uh, one of my career goals is to be an administrator in a school district. So I was wondering, like, what you think my role could be in some, like, educational reforms. Mm, why do you want to be a school administrator? I just think it's a rewarding career. You get to make an influence on people, so, yeah. Yeah, um, that's great, one, that you, that you know what you wanna do. I think, I think thinking about what kind of school administrator you wanna be and like what are the issues that folks are experiencing and how are you centering them? How are you engaging with students in the structure? How are students, um, how are students' voices? How are faculty's uh, voices the focus um, in what you're doing? What does education mean? What does public education mean um, in the organization? I think it sounds, um, simple, but it's, it's, it's hard to really think about like, wh what motivates me about this? Why do I actually care about this? I don't know. I just care. Like, no, but you clearly have a story. You clearly have some kind of connection. So rooting deeply in that and then thinking about how that connection and that vision for what you want to build, how are you bringing other people in with that? And how are you centering their experiences? Because a lot of school administrators don't necessarily care what other folks are doing. And a lot of admin, like administration's hard. Um, it's, it's a really difficult, regardless of like what, what field you're in, like there's always a lot of things to do and it's always easy to deprioritize the voices of those who are most affected by these decisions because you have a lot of people in positions of power that want things from you. Um, but I think you have a unique opportunity if you're thinking intentionally about how you wanna build um, by building systems within your school or within your department uh, where it's not just you listening to folks, but you're building structures where their voices are already valued. Um, so it's not you speaking on their behalf, but you're elevating their voice or their voice is already centered because there um, is a body where they're making decisions. Thank you. Yeah, that of course. Uh, hi, um, Ryan, uh, political science major. Um, you touched on one of the uh, largest sources of funding for the market, uh, closing down a local hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout your speech, uh, you mentioned the importance of sitting back, sitting back and listening. So if someone from a public policy perspective came forward, um, instinct if they were just to talk would be, we need this supermarket, um, you don't have any around here, this is what we have to do. But I'm assuming that you took the stance of sitting back and just listening to community leaders speak. So I'm curious as to what the conversations and the prior um, the priorities were within the community when that arose. When the, when the hospital piece mm -hmm. arose? Yeah. Oh, that was really tough. Um, so I think, so when Premier made this decision, um, 
there was a group of people who started immediately like protesting and organizing around it. Um, and one of the helpful things when you're thinking about um, power from like a movement ecology lens where like different people play different roles is figuring out who, um, like how are we coordinating with each other and also who was putting pressure. So um, two of the executive, the executive director of the nonprofit incubating the store and the, um, the president of the board of the store decided that they were not going to be involved in um, these protests because they were the ones dealing with those relationships and like in the fundraising and stuff. But they weren't saying, you know, other people shouldn't be doing things. It was just, we are not going to do that, but we're going to continue to coordinate. There was a time where they thought that they could actually get them to reverse course. And um, when they realized they couldn't, then the question was, how do we leverage the bad press that they're getting to get more money for the store and more of a commitment? And it ended up helping fund um, the, there's a, there's a clinic. So I didn't even talk about this. One of the coolest things about Gem City Market is that it is not a market, just a market. It's more than a market. It has um, a teaching kitchen where people learn how to um, like cook and make healthy meals. There is also a clinic that was on site um, that would have that has a nurse practitioner and a nutritionist that um, were able to, to have appointments and see people because again, this issue is not just about food, it becomes much larger and affects all these other health outcomes. So once they realized that we couldn't, um, that the hospital wasn't coming back, then the question was how do we leverage what's happening right now to be able to get more resources for, resources for the store? Um, but I don't think it was, like it wasn't an easy, it wasn't an easy situation. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Appreciate yeah, for sure. And let me just echo that. Um, please join me in thanking Atana for a very inspired and motivational talk. We can't wait to bring you back again to see what you say 10 years later or sooner than that. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks y'all.